Hey guys, it's Trevor here with Reedy's Time with Parker and Trevor. So today we're going to try to um, we're on our last couple of chapters of Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Um, so we're actually on chapter 16 and I think there's 19 chapters. Yep, 19 chapters. So um, three more to go after the, including this one. So in chapter 15, um, Parker read about how Brian actually caught hit, um, killed a bird. So that's his first meal from his turtle eggs, um, berries, and his fish. So, um, his first big meal, I think he's really excited about it. So, let's we'll see uh, what happens in chapter 16. And now he stood at the end of the long part of the lake and was not the same, would not be the same again. There had been many first days. First arrow day when he had used thread from his t tattered old piece of windbreaker and some pitch from his stump to put put sil slivers of feather on a dry willow shaft to make an arrow that would fly correctly. Not accurately. He never he never got really good with it, but fly correctly so that if, if a rabbit or fool bird sat in one place long enough, close enough, that he had enough arrows, he could hit it. That brought first rabbit day, when he killed one of the large rabbits with an arrow and, and skinned it as he had the first bird, cooked it in the same in the same to find the meat as good. Not as rich as the bird, but still good and there were strips of fat on the back of the rabbit that cooked into the meat to make it richer. Now he went back and forth between rabbit and fool, fool birds when he could, when he could, filling it with, in with fish in the middle. Always hungry. I'm always hungry, but I can do it now. I can get food, and I know I can get food, and it makes me more. I know what I can do. He moved closer to the lake to a stand of nut brush. These were thick brushes with little stickler pods that held green nuts, nuts that he thought he might be able to eat, but they weren't ripe yet. He was out for a fool bird, and they liked to hide in the base of the thick part of the nut brush, back into where the stems were close, to, close together and provided cover. In the second clump, he saw a bird. He moved close to it, paused when, he, when, he, when the head of feathers came up and it made a sound like a cricket. A sound, a sign of alarm just before it flew, and then moved closer when the, when the feathers went down and the bird relaxed. He did this four times, and they were looking at the bird directly, moving toward it at, at an angle so it seemed he was moving off to the side. He had perfected this method after many attempts, and it worked so well that he actually caught one with his bare hands until he was standing less than three feet away from the bird, which was frozen in a hiding attitude in the brush. The bird held for, for him and he put an arrow into the bow, one of the feathered arrows, not a fish arrow, and drew and released. It was, the, it was a clean miss and he took another arrow out of the cloth pouch at his belt, which he'd made from a piece of windy windbreaker sleeve, tied at one end up end to make a bottom. The fool bird sat still for him and he did not look directly at it until he drew the second arrow and aimed and released and missed again. This time the bird jerked a bit and the arrow stuck next to it so close it almost brushed its breast. Brian only had two more arrows and he debated moving slowly to change the sphere over to his right hand and use that to kill the bird. One more shot he decided he would try it again. He slowly brought the, another arrow out, put it on the string and aimed the release. This time he saw the flurry of feathers that many had hit it. The bird had been struck off center and was flopping around wildly. Brian jumped on it, grabbed it, and slammed it against the ground once, shar sharply to kill it. Then he stood and retrieved his arrows and made sure they were all right and went down to the lake to wash the blood off his hands. He kneeled at the water's edge and put the dead bird and his weapons down and dipped his hands into the water. It was nearly the last act of his, of his life. Later, he would not know why he started the term, some smell or sound. A tiny brushing sound that suddenly caught his ear and nose, and he began to turn. He had his head halfway around when he saw a brown wall of fur detach itself from the forest to his rear and come down on him like a runaway truck. He just had time to see it. It was a moose. He knew them from pictures, but not know, could not guess how large they were when it hit him. It was a cow, and she had no horns, but she took him in the left side of the back with her fore forehead, took him and threw him in out into the water, and then came around after him to finish the job. He had another half second to fill his lungs with air, and she was on him again, using her head to drive him down into the mud of the bottom. Insane, he thought. Just the, just that, the world insane. Mud filled his eyes and ears, and the horns, the horn, 
boss on the moose drove him deeper and deeper into the bottom muck. Then suddenly it was over and he felt alone. He sputtered to the surface, sucking air and fighting, fighting panic. He whipped, wiped the mud off and water off his eyes and cleared them to the, and saw the cow standing sideways on him, to him. Not ten feet away, calmly chewing on a lily pad rot, she didn't appear to even see him or didn't seem to care about him. And Brian turned carefully and began to swim crawl out of the water. As soon as he moved, the hair on the, her back went up and she charged him again, using her head and front hose this time, slamming him back down into the water on his back this time. He screamed the air out of his lungs and hammered her head with his fist and filled his, his throat with water and she left again. Once more he came to the surface, but he was hurt now, hurt inside, hurt his ribs, and he stayed hunched over, pretended to be dead. She was standing, eating. Brian studied her on one eye, looking up to the bank with the other wondering how seriously he was ended, wondering if she would let him go this time. Insane. He started to move ever so slowly. Her head turned to her back. Her hair went up. Like the hair on an angry dog, and he stopped, took a slow breath, the hair went down, and she ate. Move, hair up, stop, hair down. Move, hair up, a half foot at a time, until... Until he was at the edge of the water. He stayed on his hands and knees, indeed he was hurt, so he wasn't sure he could walk anyway, and she seemed to accept that and let him crawl slowly out of the water and into the trees and brush. When he was behind a tree, he stood carefully and took stock. Legs seemed alright, but his ribs were hurt bad. He could only take short breaths and seemed to need jabbing pain, and his right shoulder seemed to be wrenched somehow. Also, his bow and spear and fool bird were in the water. At least he could walk and he had just about decided to leave everything when the cow moved out of the deeper water and left him. As quickly as she'd come, walking down along the shoreline, in the shallow water, with her long legs making sucking sounds when she pulled them free of the mud. Hanging on a pine limb, he watched her go, half expecting her to turn and come back to run over him again. But she kept going, and when she was well gone from the sight, he went to the bank and found the bird, and then waited out a bit to get his bow and next spear. Neither of them were broke, and the arrows, incredibly, were still on his belt in the pouch. Although messed up with the mud and water, it took him most an hour to work his way back around the lake. His legs worked well enough, but it took him two or three fast steps. He would begin to deep, breathe deeply, and the pain from his ribs would stop him, and he'd have to lean against the tree until he sulked, and he could slow back down the shallow breathing. She had done more damage than he had originally thought. The insane cow, no sense at all to it just madness. When he got to the shelter, he crawled inside and was grateful that the coals were still glowing and he had thought to get wood first thing in the morning to be ready for the day. Grateful that he had thought to get enough wood for two or three days at a time. Grateful that he had fish nearby if he needed to eat. Grateful, finally as he dozed off, that he was alive. So insane, he thought, letting sleep cover his, cover the pain in his chest. Such an insane att attack for no reason. And he fell asleep when with his mind trying to make the moose have reason. The noise awakened him. It was a low sound, a low roaring. It came from the wind. His eyes snapped open, not because it was loud, because it was new. He had felt wind in the shelter, felt the rain that came with wind, and heard thunder many times in the past 47 days, but not this, not this noise. Low, almost alive, almost from a throat somehow. And the sound of the noise was a roar, a far off roar, but coming at him, and when he was fully awake, he sat up in the dark, darkness grimacing with pain from his ribs. The pain was different now, a tightened pain, and it seemed less, but the sound. So strange, he thought, a mystery sound, a sphere sound, <coughs> a bad sound. He took some small wood and got the fire going again, felt some little comfort to che and cheer from, for, from the flames, but also felt that she sh he should get ready. He did not know, but he should get ready. The sound was coming for him, was coming just for him, and he had to get ready. The sound wanted him. He found the spear and bow where they were hanging on the pegs of the shelter wall and brought his weapons to the bed he had made of pine bows. More comfort, but like comfort to the flames, it didn't work with new threat he didn't understand yet. Restless threat, he thought, stood out of the shelter away from the flames to study the sky, but it was too dark. The sound meant something to him, something from his memory, something he had remembered, read about, something he had seen on television, something, oh, he thought. Oh no, it was wind. 
wind like the sound of a train with the low belly roar of a train. It was a tornado. That's what it is. The roar of a train meant bad wind. It was coming for him. God, he thought, on top of the moose, not this. Not this. But it was too late. Too late to do anything. And strange stillness, he looked at the night sky, then turned back into his shelter and was leaving to go through the opening when it hit. Later, he would think of it think of it and find that it was the same as the moose, just insanity. He was taken in the back by some mad force and driven into the shelter on a train, slammed down to the pine branch with his bed. At the same time, the wind tore at the fire and sprayed red coals and sparks in the cloud around him. And then it backed out, seemed to hesitate momentarily, and returned with a massive roar, a roar that took his ears and mind and body. He was against, ripped against the front of the wall of the shelter like a rag, Felt a ripping pain in his ribs again, then it hammered back down to the sand once more. While the wind took the whole wall, his bed, the fire, his tools, all of it, and threw it out onto the lake, gone out of sight, gone forever. He felt the burning on his neck and reached on to find red coals there. He brushed those off, found more in his pants, brushed those away, and the wind hit again. Heavy gust, tearing gust. He heard trees snapping in the forest around the rock felt his body slipping out and clawed at the rocks to hold himself down. He couldn't think, just tell and knew that he was praying, but didn't know what the prayer was. Knew that he wanted to be, stay and be. Then the wind moved to the lake. Brian heard the great heard the great roaring, sucking sounds of the water, and opened his eyes to see the lake torn by the wind. Water slamming in great waves that went in all ways, fought each other and then rose into a spout of water going up into the night sky like a wet column of light. It was beautiful and terrible at the same time. The tornado tore one more time at the shore of the opposite side of the lake. Brian could hear those trees being ripped down, and then it was gone, gone as rapidly as it come. It left nothing, nothing but Brian in the pitch dark. He could not find anything. He could, he could find nothing of where his fire had been, not a spark, nothing of a shelter, tools, or bed. Even the body of the fool bird was gone. I am back to nothing, he thought. Trying to find things in the dark back to where I was when I crashed, hurt in the pain just the same. As if to emphasize his thoughts, the mosquitoes with the fire gone and the protective smoke of long water saving him came back in thick, nostril clogging swarms. All was left was the hatchet in his belt, still there, but now it began to rain and the downpour he would never find anything, dry enough to get a fire going and pull and at least he pulled his battered body back onto the overhang where his, where his bed had been and wrapped his arms around his ribs. Sleep did come, couldn't come with the insects ripping at him. He lay, so he lay the rest of the night, slapping mosquitoes and chewing his mind on the bed. The morning he had been fat, well, almost fat and happy, sure of everything with good weapons, weapons and food and the sun in the face and things looking good for the future. And inside of one day, just one day, he had been run over by a moose in a tornado, lost everything, and was back to square one, just like that. A flip of some giant co coin, and he was a loser. But there is a difference now, he thought. There really is a difference. It might be hit, but I'm not done. When the light comes, I'll start to rebuild. I still have the hatchet, and that's all I had in the first place. Come on, he thought. Burying his teeth in the darkness, come on. Is that the best you knew? Is that all you can hit me with as a moose in a tornado? Well, he thought, holding his ribs and smiling, and then spitting out, spitting mosquitoes out of his mouth. Well, that won't get the job done. That was the difference now. He changed, and he was tough. I'm tough where it counts, tough in the head. In the air, right before dawn, a kind of cold snap came down. Something else new. This cold snap of mosquitoes settled back into the damp grass, and under the leaves he could sleep or doze. And the last thought he had that morning as the cl as he closed his eyes was, I hope the tornado hit the moose. When he awakened, the sun was cooking the, the inside of his mouth and it dried his tongue to leather. He had fallen into the deeper sleep with his mouth open and just at the dawn it tasted as if he had been sucking on his foot all night. He rolled out and almost below with pain from his ribs. They had tightened in the night and seemed to pull at his chest when he moved. He slowed his movements and stood slowly without sp stretching undully and went to the lake for a drink. <coughs> At the shore he kneeled carefully with great gentleness and drank the rinse of his mouth. 
To his right, he saw that the fish pond was still there, although the willow gate had gone and there was no fish. They'll come back, he thought. As soon as I make a spear or bow to get one or two for, for bait, they'll come back. He turned to look at his shelter, saw the same, <coughs> that some of the wood from the wall was scattered around the beach but was still there. Then he saw his bow jammed into a driftwood log, broken but with precious strength still intact. Not so bad now, not so bad. He looked down to the shoreline for, for other parts of his wall, and that's when he saw it. Out in the lake, the short part of the L, something curved and yellow sticking six or eight inches out of the water. It was a bright color, not on earth or a natural color, and for a second he could not place it, and he knew what it was. It's the tail of the plane. He said it aloud, half expecting to hear someone answer him. There, there it was, sticking out of the water. The tornado must have flipped the plane around somehow when it hit the lake, changed the position of the plane, and the raised the tail. Well, he thought, we'll just look at this. And all the same moment, a cutting thought hit him. He thought of the pilot still in the plane, and that brought a shiver and massive sadness that seemed to settle on him like a weight. And he thought that he should say or do something for the pilot, some words, but he didn't know any in the pilot's words that religiously. So he went down... So he went down to the side of the water and looked at the plane and focused his mind the way he did when he was hungry in the cool birds and wanting to concentrate. Focused in on the pilot and thought, have breath, have rest, breath. So, that was chapter 16. Probably our longest chapter so far. Um, a lot happened. So, Brian first um, got attacked by a moose. So... That's something new that happened. Um, a moose attacked him and I think broke his ribs or punctured a lung. That's my guesses if I was to take a guess. So he got injured and then that night um, a tornado hit his shelter and ripped everything to shreds and he basically lost everything. So, but as we can tell through the book, Brian has toughened up and learned to deal with these things and he seems like he's okay with it and is going to um, build it all up again. Um, and he also made a discovery of the plane, which the tornado had brought up from the water when it went on the water throughout the chapter. So, more interesting stuff. Um, we'll see what he does with the plane, if he explores it or finds a black box or something. But we'll have to see what happens in chapter 17. So, thanks guys for listening.